He runs a video marketing agency called I Am Media, but Alex Miner is more than just a videographer. He's a business strategist who helps others use the limitless powers of video to shape shift their business. Given that YouTube is the second largest search engine with more than 2.68 billion users and the second most popular platform for influence marketers, Growing a channel takes work and commitment. We're going to dive into the basics of optimizing your channel, how to choose your focus, and find a way to make YouTube one of your best tools for networking. Please welcome Alex Miner. Well, thank you. Thank you. And may I say that was an excellent intro. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and like, where did you grow up and what was your first job? Oh, well, I grew up in Maryland mostly. My parents were in the army when I was born. So I was actually born in North Carolina, but the majority of my memories were made in Maryland. And as for my first job, I worked in a library and that job wasn't the greatest, but it was a job that wasn't super demanding, but I did end up leaving that job because I felt like I wasn't given as equal a shot at, you know, kind of getting certain positions as other employees who were there. And looking back now, I see they were there long, they were there before me. Don't know how long they were there before me, but in my inexperience, I was like, why are they getting to do this? I want to do that. And it's, you know, kid stuff. <laughs> so at what point did you know that this I am media platform was what you were going to do? When I had no other choice. <laughs> And what I mean by that is for a good chunk of time, probably about 10, 12-ish years, I made the majority of my money in the corporate events industry. That's working big yearly conferences, general sessions, breakout rooms, expos, trade shows, those sorts of things. And my technical background for that is I'm a video engineer. Uh, I'm a projectionist. I do those ultra wide screen blends that you might see if you go to some of those big corporate conferences and they just got like a hundred foot long screen or something like that. Like I know how to set those up and uh, combine the images of multiple projectors to do that. And that's where I was doing pretty well. I wasn't at the top of the the pack, but I definitely wasn't near the bottom and doing well for myself for several years until the pandemic. And now I had been building the company as kind of a byproduct of being in the industry because that's where I started doing camera work. But camera work in the corporate event space is very basic. It's very boring unless you happen to get the chance to do one of the after party concerts that some of these events have, things like that. And there were a lot of those unbeknownst to many people. Like I would work an event. I was working an event earlier this year where Nelly was one of the sponsors of the event because he was promoting his, I think he has a vodka line that he was promoting. It was an alcohol trade show. He was there sponsoring the event. He performed. It was a big deal. And I've done shows where Train was there and one of the guys from Peter, Paul and Mary. Oh. So corporate shows, very good for for recording artists. Uh, and good but, money too, when, probably. Oh, 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 heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really good money. I worked a Zumba thing one year and I think they had, I I would swear they had Shakira. I could be wrong, but that you they couldn't get, they, remember if they had Shakira. <laughs> I didn't go to them party, man. There was too many people, too wild for me. Mm. But yeah, a lot of money in corporate events for big music stars. But other than those, it's very boring. You're watching somebody go back and forth on stage. And eventually I bought my own camera equipment just thinking, because I also dabbled in music. I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll help some of my friends shoot music videos or I'll do some YouTube stuff, whatever. But I actually ended up falling in love with it. And so I was building the company on the side, but 
still doing the corporate events as my main thing. But the pandemic hit and all the corporate events went away overnight. I was out on the road doing shows January 2020, February 2020. And when I got off the plane that last week of February, all I saw was cancellation notices in my inbox. And I went home. I quietly lost my mind for about two months. And then I said, okay, these checks are running out. We have to make this work. And that's what we've been doing ever since. And, you know, a natural fit to do what you're doing right now. And were you always thinking about focusing on corporate, although they probably need the most help when it comes to video content? Well, I have two kids and, you know, so they require money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I try to be a good dad. I feel the weight of that responsibility every day. I was just like, I got to figure out how to feed these kids. There wasn't any other choice for me. And I had this particular set of skills <laughs> and tried to employ them the best way that I knew how to try to make some income. And music, most independent music artists are broke. So yeah. trying to make music videos and stuff like that, I knew it was a losing game. I was intensely interested in documentary work, but that's also something that can be very challenging to make a living at. You can and do it. long term till you get paid, yes. Yeah. So you can do it. And I've known people who have lived in that world and it was just as inconsistent as my life has been that was way more inconsistent. And I'm like, I can't roll the dice on that. I do enough of that. And businesses have money and they want to do things to attract customers or to serve their customers better. And to me, it was just like, okay, I think I got a better chance of getting paid over there. And once I started diving into the world of marketing and branding, it was just fascinating because there's so much to learn. There's so many different areas of expertise, different approaches, uh, specializations, and, you know, it's been working out. Just jumping into your skill set, what is it about the video format that appeals to you? Well, I've always been a very visual person, which is kind of funny considering that I spent so many years doing music and, and being a producer and a writer and and things like that, where you would think I would be more auditory, but from the jump, I've always been very visual. So I think it was kind of a natural fit to move from music into video. And part of the appeal for me was like, as a musician, I am very slow. I'm very slow to create and it take me forever to finish a project maybe not forever to finish a certain song, but to finish a whole project, it would take me so, so long. And that was very frustrating to me. But with video, I can finish things a lot faster. Or the projects are a lot smaller to complete. It's not always trying to complete a collection of things. It's usually trying to complete the one thing. And I have found over the years that finishing things energizes me. I like that feeling of accomplishment when I can look back and say, okay, we did that. It's good. They love it. We can move on to the next thing. And that gives me energy. And so for me, music was frustrating in that way where it took me so long to finish things. But with video, it demands that I finish things in a shorter span of time. And combined with all the visual elements and just the variety of people that I work with and the variety of projects and goals and outcomes. It's very appealing for me. And corporate speak and social speak are two different vocabularies. So how do you help businesses find that right messaging for their videos? Because let's, you want to have that professional video for your corporate uh, overview, but also you want to have a little bit of, humanity in it as well to to get the eyeball so how do you um, guide them on that the thing that I try to get businesses to see is that when they're telling their stories or when I'm helping them tell their stories is that it can't be about them it has to be about the people they serve it has to be about their clients it's got to be about their customers and it's got to answer the question of how do you make their lives easier 
if everything that you're putting out is about, well, we've been established for this many years and we've won this many awards and we're so great and our competitors suck and this is the reason you should buy my widget. No one cares. No one cares. You're not speaking to them. You're blowing smoke in the air. So if you can figure out how to translate your benefits, your features, your products and services into a message that is in the framework of let us do this for you to make your life better. And this is why we want to do this for you and why we care and why you should care as a byproduct because we're trying to make your life better. You can create stories that resonate. And that's what I help folks do because a lot of times when they come up with their, their brand message, quote unquote, or, and their taglines and all these things, it's very stiff. It's not organic. It's not, it, it's like you said, it's not human. And that human element is so important and it gets pushed to the side a lot of times. And especially with smaller businesses, the human element is what's going to make people trust you. It's going to be what attracts them to you. It's what's going to make them choose you over a big box or brand name that that everybody knows. So you've really got to stand out. And the way to stand out is to be a person. What are your guiding principles of video production? That the video doesn't matter. And I know that sounds like crazy coming from the video person, but when I say that, I mean that the story is what matters. The content is what matters. The message is what matters. I can make pretty images all day, but if they're not paired with a story or a message or some kind of intentional strategic thinking, pretty images aren't going to get you anywhere. It frustrates me intensely when I see uh, video content that's been created for companies and brands, especially smaller ones where you know those dollars are more precious to spend. And the videographer or the production company or whoever it was that worked on it with them, whether it was internal or external, they didn't put any story in it. They didn't attach any message to it or, or none that's discernible to me as a consumer. You know, all it is is just a bunch of images set to music and I'm sitting there thinking like, what is this supposed to do? What is it that you want from me? What am I supposed to get from this? And I feel like a lot of people end up wasting their money and then getting disappointed and disillusioned about what video could possibly do for their business because they're working with folks who aren't approaching the creation of the video with a content and marketing and branding mindset. If all you're doing is focusing on the video and the quality and the colors and the images, it's going to fall flat. I mean, maybe you'll get some views if it's really cool stuff. Like maybe you'll get some views, maybe it'll go viral, but the chances of that are slim. And a lot of times virality is not what you're searching for anyway. What you're searching for is effectiveness. Yeah. You can have all the eyeballs you want, but you want the eyeballs that are actually going to pick up the phone or actually click through to your uh, contact and the rest of your channels. So also, you know, I imagine there are some corporations that come to you and think that the one video is going to solve all their problems, but really that's another, you got to have thing. like way more, you got to yeah. put stuff out there. There is a skill set that many folks lack where and, and this is the thing that a lot of people, I think, get wrong when it comes to using video as their vehicle of choice and growing their brand or marketing themselves or marketing their business. They think that they have to reinvent the wheel every time the camera turns on. Yeah. One of my favorite YouTube channels is by a guy named Dr. Mike Diamond. He is a physician. I think he's... I don't, I don't know for sure. I think he's in like South Africa or something uh, based on his accent. Not completely sure. But anyway, this dude basically makes the same four or five videos over and over and over again about weight loss and how to jumpstart your weight loss, different strategies to target different areas about things like that. But for the most part, 
And I watch all his videos because they're very, put together very well. But if you watch a lot of his content, he's basically making the same four or five videos over and over again. And I get a kick out of it because because he's one of the only people who I've seen do this. And it's and it's the right thing to do. And it works for his audience. It, well, the thing is, it's very effective. I could tell it's very effective in that his business is called Sculpt by Science. And he basically helps high performing folks, whether they be executives or whatnot, jumpstart their weight loss journey. And he's got the proof and the receipts to show that it's effective. He's part of the proof. He's in very great shape. He's he's done bodybuilding contests and stuff, but he's a broken record. And most people need to become a broken record because that's how you get people to understand exactly who you are, what it is that you do and how that you can help them. You have to say it over and over and over again, because if you only say it once, Mm -hmm. People are going to forget. And, or if you change the message every time that you get in front of the camera or get on your socials or send out something via email, whatever it is, if you're changing it up every single time because you think you're going to be boring or you don't want to come off as saying the same thing. No, you need to say the same thing over and over. I mean, what do you think taglines are? What do you think slogans are? It's a way to say the same thing over and over so that it's memorable. Repetition is what breeds familiarity. And so if you're doing a long-term strategy like video, which video is, one video won't fix it. Like we said, you have to be a broken record up to a point. And you You have to be strategic. Right. And I mean, your viewpoint can grow. The specifics of your messaging can grow or be nuanced, but the overarching message, the overarching mission, it's got to be the same. It's got to be cohesive. So you got to become a broken record. And too many people think they've got to do something new every time they come out the gate. So growing a YouTube channel is really damned hard works and you've done well with yours. And those subscribers don't happen overnight. So what are the basic steps of posting a video that one needs to do to get eyeballs or, you know, a eyeball on their, on that video? Okay. So (laughs) there's a lot of ways to approach this. Some of it's going to be dependent on what your subject matter is, but basic principles that kind of apply across YouTube and across niches, consistency is key. And I know you're going to hear that a lot and you're probably tired of hearing it, but with YouTube, especially consistency is going to be the key. There's so much material being uploaded to YouTube about every subject under the sun. And even if you're in more of a niche subject, The more consistently that you can show up, the more that you can be a reliable source for folks, the easier it's going to be to start gathering people to you. If you show up once and you're gone for eons, nobody knows you exist. So consistency is the first thing. Decide on a schedule that you can stick to and start producing on that schedule. Uh, I recommend creating your content in batches so that it's easier. You're doing multiple pieces of content at a time. You can upload and schedule those pieces of content. YouTube has robust scheduling tools. You could spend a week doing nothing but creating videos and content and schedule that stuff out for months so that you've only got to do it every so often. So that's number one. Two is going to be becoming that broken record. Make it very clear in every video, who the content is for and why the content is for. And and tell them, and and don't wait, don't draw it out. Like as soon as you get in there, let people know what's going on, why they should stay, what's coming up later in the video so that they have a reason to stay till the end of the video. And then we get to the end, remind them of everything that you told them. And make sure to encourage them to come back, to subscribe, to comment, to engage with the content, because algorithms like that stuff. Um, also, be comfortable with the fact that more is more. 
a lot of people get hung up over quality. They say, well, I don't want to put out this content because it's not high quality. You know, you don't know what is quality until the audience tells you it's quality. Don't get hung up on visual quality. And even that's subjective because some people don't mind or even prefer looking at stuff that was shot on an iPhone. Some people would think that a setup like mine is too fancy. They don't want to watch YouTubers like that because they feel like it's it's too slick, it's too produced, it's too it's not raw and real enough. I've seen people build empires with cell phones, you know. Movies. So caught up Ooh. on the visual quality, whatever tool that you have that can capture the audio and capture the video. And if you're going to concentrate on the quality of anything, concentrate on the audio quality yes. over the video quality because. People will forgive bad video all day. Bad audio quality will make them run for the hills. Thank you for that. I was going to bring that up if you didn't. <laughs> yeah. and, and there's even a caveat to that because I've seen channels where folks are just using their phone and they're in a echoey room every single video, but the content is good. What they're talking about matters yeah. to their audience. And if you can convey enough value with the information or be entertaining enough and whatever it is that you're discussing, whatever you're doing, all the technical stuff don't matter as long as you can get the content up and keep putting it out. So I encourage anybody who's going to do a YouTube strategy, upload as much as you can, as often as you can without it impacting your business. Because you want this to be a vehicle that's going to bring you more business. So don't do it to the detriment of your business. Make sure you can still keep the ship running and serve your customers and clients and all of that. But aside from that, do as much content as you can. Because that's the way that you're going to stand out. Because most of your competitors aren't doing it. Yeah, They're not consistently blogging. They're not consistently doing reels and shorts and TikToks. They're not consistently uploading long form videos to YouTube. They're not consistently repurposing podcasts. They're not doing this stuff. And that leaves a big gap in the market for you. Because I guarantee you, whatever your profession is, if there's a hundred of y'all, maybe 15 are doing this stuff. Yeah. And another thing a lot of people like to see too, regardless of what it is, is the behind the scenes. They want to see how the stuff is made. You can't see it on video, but even some of the behind the scenes of your business, that stuff, people look for that. Yeah. People like to know what's behind the wall. They want to see how it works. I mean, that's the reason why people like seeing concerts and live shows and stuff and why they get so excited seeing people create the music in front of them. It's the same principle, you know, listening to a finished song on your phone, streaming from Spotify, people don't really value that. They like it, but they don't really value that. But when you sing the song in front of them, it's like, oh my God, because it's happening right then and they can't do it. Yeah. We're fascinated by the process. One of the topics I wanted to discuss with you is YouTube itself, because it's like the number two search engine, YouTube journalists are impacting this sphere. And especially with uh, newsrooms and, and whatnot, downsizing and closing, what do you see as the myths of being a YouTuber or a YouTube journalist and why do they make it actually look so easy sometimes? Because a lot of other people, oh, I'll just start a YouTube channel and go viral. Because <laughs> some well, of their followers, I mean, you look at some of these YouTube journalists or YouTube people that produce content, like you say, consistently every day or every other day, they have more subscribers than the actual mainstream media in some cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is true. Well, part of it, when you say that they make it look easy, it's the same way that people with skill make anything look easy. Yeah. They put the reps in. And usually it looks easy to people because they weren't there from the beginning of the journey. So they're getting hip to people and they're seeing people when they're approaching the finish line or when they've already crossed it. When the hours of training and exercise and all that have been completed. 
And that makes it look easy because those people prepared for that day or those days or those pieces of content. So there was a lot of work that came before you even knew that they existed. A lot of times these folks who are doing it big on YouTube, they've got teams. Yeah. They somebody who's editing the video. A lot sometimes they they got people who are shooting the video. They've built their platforms up to the point where they can now focus on writing the content or brainstorming the content and then showing up. And then they get to doing the fun stuff and then they get to go away while all the grunt work is done. They're not in the salt mines, editing all the clips, uploading, scheduling, writing the descriptions and all that. Maybe some of them are. They're involved to an extent. They're at least approving a lot of this stuff. But the biggest YouTubers, they've got teams. You think Mr. Beast is editing video? No. <laughs> Casey Neistat probably is because he's Casey Neistat. But do you think anybody who's on the Young Turks is editing the video? No, they've got a whole team. And that's why they make it look easy. That's why it can look slick and sober because there's a machine behind it. And sometimes those are media houses that converted to doing stuff on YouTube and found success that way. Sometimes that's people who started out very humble and just were able to build it out over time. It's, it's different for, you know, every person, but that's why they make it look easy because many hands make light work. Personally, I've been live streaming since 2012, and it's changed my networking life and human connections. It's really opened up the world for me personally. And whereas before it was just local, I stopped going to local business meetings because it felt so closed in. So how has the digital hemisphere impacted you and your personal connections? Well, I... For that conversation, I mostly speak to LinkedIn. Mm. So LinkedIn is one of my favorite platforms. And even saying that, I don't think I take nearly the advantage of it that I should. That's just because I'm still learning. You know, I'm still learning from folks who know the platform better than me, who generate most of their business from the platform. And a lot of them are doing very, very well for themselves. And almost their entire customer base comes from LinkedIn. But I, I've connected, especially during the pandemic, with folks all over the country, even internationally. Some of those relationships have yielded business. It's just been very gratifying to build some of those relationships and to build an audience there where you, I'm looked at as an authority. And people value the information that I share when I talk about things to do with video, when I talk about things to do with social media, when I talk about things to do with podcasting, it's nice to go where people value right. your opinions. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent of any, did. you just have to be able to grow with the platforms, learn them as they change. I agree. Yep. Uh, LinkedIn is, is a great networking tool, particularly if you are working in the corporate field. So I can see where you would get a lot of um, business from that. So well, how space and also for business owners. Yeah. Um, in, in, and more so B2B businesses, but also uh, I think that there's value there for businesses that sell to consumers as well, because at the end of the day, we're all consumers. True. So what does success mean to you in this area of video are you talking about for me personally or for my clients for your clients <laughs> to me success is being able to give them what they want but also being able to push them in the direction of the things that i think that they need and being to being able to approach the relationship as an advisor instead of a waiter. Mm. If somebody comes to me and they got the blueprint and they know exactly what they want and they just need somebody to execute at a high level, that's fine. I can take orders. But a lot of times, some of the value that I bring is the fact that folks can come to me not knowing everything that they need to do or with a half-baked idea and we can help them flesh it out and we can make it bigger and better than they thought it could be. And 
we just do it better than they've ever done it before because the folks that they've dealt with before, you know, maybe had good intentions, but maybe their skill set wasn't up to par, or maybe their skill set on the video side of things was good, but they don't think of things with a marketing lens or a branding lens. And so the suggestions and guidance that they would offer to a client is not in the same league as ours. What words of advice do you have for others who may be doing this type of work for a while or they're just new to it? Keep learning. You got to keep learning. You don't know it all. There's no way that you can know it all. And whether it's from a strictly technical visual standpoint or whether it's from a marketing and branding standpoint or whether it's just learning better how to serve clients and customers how to talk to them, how to communicate, how to build your processes and your systems. There's always something else that you can learn. So never stop learning. Thank you so much, Alex. It was great to have you on this show. Well, I was glad to do it. Thank you for having me. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. Locker Room for Growth interviews our guests with honest conversation that includes compelling stories and unique professions. We also take great effort to maintain diversity among those who appear on the show. I personally have decades of experience working in multimedia journalism, including copywriting, sports reporting, radio and webcasts, and have interviewed and worked with numerous celebrities, including Hurricane Carter, the Doobie Brothers, professional NHL, CFL, and baseball players, and more. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Metis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe. <laughs>